Thanks for uh, joining us today. My name is uh, Axel Armbach. I'm a fellow here this year at the Berkman Center and at uh, CITP in uh, Princeton. Um, this is a somewhat of an uh, unusual setting. Uh, after the talk uh, the day before yesterday, um, we found out that uh, some of the backup or some of the stream have been gone. So I'll do the first 10 minutes of the talk again. I was asked to do that. And then afterwards, we will gradually um, go into the talk um, uh, into the real talk, so you'll see a different shirt, and you'll see audience, and um, uh, and that will be fine. So today I'll be talking about um, government hacking, both in the law enforcement and in the intelligence space. Um, and um, the recent response, or the response a couple of years ago by the German Constitutional Court to um, to call for a constitutional right to IT security. I start the presentation with this quote from 1971. Uh, the quote reads, in almost every issue of, weekly, uh, of the weekly computer world, which is a magazine, is an article detailing a case of computer fraud, embezzlement, or sabotage. Over 100 difficult, uh, different articles um, uh, had been written on this issue uh, from the mid-1971 until 1972. The source is down there on the slide. Uh, and this goes only to tell that even though with uh, with uh, the NSA revelations made possible by Mr. Snowden, and with some law enforcement hacking issues, uh, cases that have been popped up in recent years. We think that this is a very new issue, but it has already been around for 40 years. But legislators are only now thinking about this issue and how to respond. So we have to realize that the technical reality is 40 years ahead of, of the legislative debate. And that is something that I want to, uh, want to focus on today. Um, so hacking, government hacking has been around for a long time, but it has really accelerated in the recent years, uh, especially the last 10 to 15 years, uh, and especially the last couple of years. And this has all to do with social technical changes that you know, everybody has heard a lot about, but we move our communications, our information into the web and recently into the cloud. Um, and there was this interesting moment uh, in the mid-90s that is now commonly known as, as the crypto wars. Um, and the crypto wars were all about um, the FBI and the NSA and other government authorities all around the world were saying that communications were going dark, uh, moving behind, for example, HTTPS encryption. And that um, made it much harder for government authorities to do the conventional types of, of surveillance through wiretaps. Now, this led uh, to these crypto wars where one uh, part of, of society, uh, civil society, for example, um, uh, but also industry, financial industries, pleaded for strong cryptography to protect communications. But on the other hand, you had government authorities in law enforcement and intelligence saying, no, um, we should uh, uh, not allow this uh, strong encryption to happen um, because uh, that disables our surveillance capabilities. Now, the interesting moment was the crypto wars, and the conventional wisdom is that the crypto wars had been won by industry and civil society. So there's this famous book uh, by Stephen Levy uh, called Crypto that details or that, that outlines uh, the whole um, crypto wars, and the undertitle is quite, uh, quite uh, beautiful. It says, how the code rebels beat the government saving privacy in the digital age. Now, for over a decade, this had, has been the conventional wisdom. It has been uh, very much part of uh, you know, technical and, and legal debates that uh, the crypto wars were won and encryption saves the day. Well, of course, with the recent uh, revelations made possible by Mr. Snowden, uh, for example, the NSA bull run uh, uh, revelations, but also last week, um, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, we see that this is not really the case, and we're actually a bit more in a situation uh, like this beautiful uh, picture at, um, uh, that I found um, um, where you have a clunky internet infrastructure and the code rebels going uh, you know, up and enjoying the excitement of the ride and then finding at the end that uh, there's an obstacle um, between their legs when they're down. And, this picture, We Remember Freedom, uh, plays with that nostalgia. I think it's a beautiful artwork. That's more realistic uh, in the situation that we are today. Only last week, 
uh, Glenn Greenwald, the journalist, his outfit with Ryan uh, Gallagher, the new outfit of The Intercept, published uh, new slides on how the NSA plans to infect millions of computers with malware. These are all uh, about network attacks. Uh, at the end of December, um, uh, Der Spiegel, Laura Poitras, Jake Applebaum and others published the Tailored Access Operations Catalog. Um, which is much more about hacking into devices. And now we know that uh, the capabilities um, of these intelligence agencies all around the world are, are, are enormous and that all vulnerabilities in communications are basically being exploited. Also in the law enforcement space, recent quote from the Wa uh, Washington Post uh, about the, the FBI. Uh, and it reads, the most powerful FBI surveillance software can covertly download files, photographs, store emails, gather real-time images by activating cameras connected to computers, say, um, say court documents people and people with familiar with this technology. So this is happening. And the plausible deniability about government hacking that has been very much uh, uh, present in, in, in policy debates, it's now gone. We know that this is happening uh, and that it's increasing and that it is very problematic. But uh, today uh, we'll talk about uh, Western governments. So how should we understand the hacking government, uh, the hacking efforts of Western governments and how should we respond to them? And the goal for today's talk at the end will be to co-create and, and think about uh, and have you all uh, think about uh, an agenda for research policy and also activism. And activism I think is very important on the short term to raise the importance of the issue and to do fact-finding. So today will not be directly about uh, something that has been very much uh, in the news lately. And the Citizen Lab uh, of Berkman friend uh, Ron Diebert has done some fantastic work in this space, um, uh, which is all about uh, governments, non-Western governments. And I'm, I'm fully aware of the contentious uh, 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 distinction be uh, between that. But here... Um, uh, uh, there's been a lot of coverage about how these non-Western uh, governments have been uh, purchasing hacking software uh, made by uh, Western companies. Um, this is a slide on uh, um, a hacking team, one of those companies, and the suspected governments that use their, their RCS software all around the world. Well, you see uh, some, some pretty interesting countries there, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, Turkey, Nigeria, even Ethiopia. The Ethiopian case has been uh, covered by the Washington Post lately. Uh, but today is not directly about that. Why? Because uh, Western governments have a long tradition of dual use regulation. So um, um, arms treaties, uh, not selling your, your weapons uh, or your digital weapons for that matter to non-Western governments and authoritarian regimes. There's already a lot of great work being done, second reason. And the third reason, and I think that's really uh, at the heart of this issue, is that it's super, I mean, it's very attractive for Western governments and Western politicians to point their finger at these companies and authoritarian regimes. Uh, it's easy to condemn uh, for hegemons, basically, uh, other governments. But what I want to talk about today is that Western governments themselves are very much engaged in this. Um, uh, and we have to have a, a, a much more rigorous debate on this. Okay, so today um, the outline is, I will first uh, discuss some hacking cases by Western governments. Then I will highlight, um, you know, uh, it could be 11, it could be 37, but I want to specifically focus on 11 problems with government hacking. Um, uh, I have a longer blog post uh, on that, um, if you want to read more about that, which is also on the Berkman uh, uh, website um, where you found this talk, if you want to do more reading. Um, then I'll talk about this new constitutional right to IT security, which was proposed by, uh, which has been installed by the German Federal Constitutional Court. Um, and uh, you already see traces in the European Court of Human Rights of that. Uh, being accepted. And finally, I want to discuss with the audience, uh, and I have discussed with the audience, um, these elements of a, of a research agenda and, uh, and a discussion. All right, so first, these hacking cases by Western governments. There was, uh, not so long ago, about a month ago, um, this fantastic conference put together by Chris Sugoyan 
um, uh, in Yale. Um, the stream is online. Uh, if you're interested, you should definitely take a look. I had a bunch of great speakers, and um, I was there as well. And uh, some, yeah, you know, considerable parts of the talk are inspired by those speakers, and I tried to attribute uh, where I could. Um, um, but definitely worth a look if you want to have more information is this law enforcement and hacking panel uh, conference at, at Yale. Um, uh, there I discussed two of these uh, cases, but here I have a lot more time to go into the detail. So um, let's just separate three cases of government hacking, uh, law enforcement investigation, botnet prosecution and mitigation, a Dutch case, and this ubiquitous intelligence gathering. Okay, so let's start with uh, law enforcement investigations. Um, in the US, um, this has been going on for quite some time, and, um, uh, but we know very little about this. Uh, and only uh, a couple of months ago, um, um, we uh, got insight into uh, a DFBI requesting a warrant uh, from a magistrate judge um, uh, to hack into the computer. Um, uh, uh, of a certain person um, um, for, uh, because uh, they suspected um, that uh, from this particular device um, uh, 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 they, they, expect, uh, they suspected from this particular device somebody using somebody else's uh, credentials to log into internet banking environment and do some transactions there. Um, they wanted to hack into the device to find out who this person was and uh, whether uh, um, they could uh, uh, find, find the suspect. And that was, that was exactly the problem with this case. And Magistrate Judge Smith, who also spoke at this Yale conference in April 2013, he turned this FBI hacking request down. And why, you know, the three central reasons why he did this is that the FBI wanted to hack into a device but they didn't really know the identity of the suspect. Um, that's why they wanted to hack into the computer. And they didn't even know the location of the device. So they wanted to do a search for uh, a device and of a device. They wanted to search the device uh, they thought uh, uh, had uh, accessed this account, but they weren't sure. And they. Uh, Whenever they uh, got this um, uh, warrant, they want also wanted to uh, search the computer itself. And there, um, the hugely uh, problematic uh, aspects of this uh, warrant manifested himself, uh, themselves, because um, uh, this is basically comes very close, Judge Smith said, to a general warrant. You don't know the identity of the suspect, so you run the risk of uh, searching for uh, uh, the computer of something, somebody that is uh, very uh, you know, uh, uh, innocent uh, and has not even been suspected of a crime. And you don't even know the location. So this computer could be anywhere in the world. And this computer could be at a public space, maybe a public library, for example, uh, a computer that many people use uh, uh, or in an internet cafe uh, rather than one person. And he said, uh, uh, Judge Smith uh, ruled that uh, that uh, does not satisfy the particularity requirement of the Fourth Amendment. And the third reason was also that um, um, what the FBI wanted to do is uh, look for IP addresses, but also uh, do, uh, conduct video surveillance. Uh, they wanted to turn on the webcam uh, on this particular computer and um, uh, look whoever uh, was using it. In, uh, in the Texas district, there is uh, strong Fourth Amendment requirements for video surveillance that hadn't been met. So this is a rare case of a warrant coming out. At the same Yale conference, Professor Donahue of Georgetown said, well, I've been researching, I've been trying to research this issue, but there's a very big problem uh, because um, I found dozens of cases from California to the New York district uh, where the FBI requested warrants, but um, they were sealed. So, uh, and Judge Smith uh, reiterated this point. Uh, they both pointed that uh, there is no public scrutiny possible of this practice by the FBI when all those co court cases are sealed. So we don't have an idea of the scope and how often this uh, uh, is, is being done because these court cases are sealed. This is a big problem that needs to be addressed. Okay, second case. Um, 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 the Bundestrojaner. This is a very, uh, um, uh, this is a case that already 
started public debate in Germany about eight years ago. So uh, one of the states of the federal government, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, North Rhine-Westfalen, one of the states wanted to legislate uh, the use of government malware by law enforcement agencies and made a law. And this law was challenged ultimately at the Supreme Court in Germany, the Federal Constitutional Court. Uh, and uh, here is the Federal Constitutional Court. You, you see their, uh, um, um, their funky hats. And what was so nice about this case is that um, um, the Bundesverfassungsgericht um, uh, invited three computer security professors and, uh, and one computer security expert from the Chaos uh, Computer Club uh, to be part of the court proceedings, testing the validity of this law uh, against the, uh, the German constitution. Uh, and this Bundesverfassungsgericht, the, the, the German Supreme Court, really uh, went to great lengths to understand the technical details. And um, um, uh, ultimately, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about the ruling later, but ultimately uh, in 2008, the Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, ruled that the uh, German state law um, was uh, inviolate, so was uh, breaching uh, or violating the German constitution and came up with this new constitutional right to IT security. Very interesting case. What I want to talk about now is that in 2011, um, the Chaos Computer Club uh, uh, got hold of uh, a piece of government malware. So even though in 2008, the German Constitutional Court um, uh, uh, ruled uh, that uh, government hacking is, uh, uh, violates the Constitution under the specific law that had been uh, installed, um, um, it found three years later the Chaos uh, uh, Computer Club uh, found government uh, malware in the wild. They were able to reverse engineer it, to, uh, reverse engineer it um, and this secretly deployed government malware uh, uh, turned out to be very problematic. And this re uh, process of reverse engineering is highly instructive for us to better understand government ha hacking in the, mal uh, in, the, in the law enforcement space. So let me tell you some, some technical details about, um, uh, about, uh, about the malware itself. So the first very important uh, aspect of this is that the government made false claims uh, about the malware itself. Um, the government always held that, uh, uh, even in the constitutional court case, that uh, their government malware, their Trojan, was used uh, only for source wiretapping. So only for listening into the communications between the hacked device and other devices. Basically a wiretap. But what uh, the, um, the German, uh, uh, the Chaos Computer Club found was that um, uh, in the malware, the capability was already uh, built into it to do remote searches. And a remote search is something different than a wiretap because that's when you actually go into a device and search on its hard drives, etc., for more information. Not a wiretap when some, something is communicated, but actually looking a bit similar to a house search, what's, what's, what's on the computer. So the government held, no, this is only for wiretapping, but the Chaos Com Computer Club found, no, this is also, uh, they're also able to use this for remote searching. Another false claim by the government was that uh, we will always, um, uh, our government malware will always be case specific. So our malware is custom, custom made and we have quality audits every time we deploy one specific piece of malware. Well, this is also something that the Chaos Computer Club was able to debunk because they found several pieces of malware which were exactly the same, not custom made at all. And then, most critically, uh, the malware had a lot of deep security flaws. So uh, what happened? Um, um, uh, most importantly, I think, um, uh, it was fairly badly uh, encrypted and some things weren't even encrypted. So try to imagine that uh, the government installs uh, a virus or, or a piece of malware on your computer and then is able to, you know, from the law enforcement offices, uh, give the piece of malware on your computer commands. Now, these commands 
that travel all over the internet until they reach your computer, the piece of malware, were unencrypted. So if you were able to intercept those commands, you were actually able to change the malware and to change the commands given to the malware as a man in the middle attacker. So try to, try to let that rest in for a moment and think about its implications. The implications are that, for example, you could uh, uh, better understand what kind of uh, commands law enforcement gives to the computer, but you could also modify those commands. So you could actually tamper with, uh, uh, with the malware in a way that uh, lets you, as a third person, so as a man in the middle attacker, uh, for example, uh, do other stuff on the computer of an end user. So this is highly problematic. Um, a second thing you could do is impersonate those authorities. So you couldn't, you could even pretend as a third person that you are the government, and uh, uh, give um, uh, and use the malware to give all sorts of commands to that computer, or maybe even to uh, um, um, use the malware yourself in other cases. So hack other systems and 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 do that. And then a third, uh, very uh, big problem is that uh, as a man in the middle attacker, you could actually go back, use the malware to hack law enforcement systems. So you could actually, and this is, I mean, the, the, the consequences of this are enormous, of course. Um, you could actually go use the malware and go into the systems of law enforcement itself, and then uh, change all sorts of uh, 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 aspects uh, of a government law enforcement databases. For example, I mean, the implications um, uh, you could think of uh, are, are enormous. So all these problems emerged, highly insecure government malware deployed even though uh, the government uh, uh, had a constitutional court ruling against it. Um, um, you know, government malware not being specific, um, but generally used with all sorts of capabilities already built in highly problematic case, highly secretively deployed, and only because the Chaos Computer Club reverse engineered it, we've been able to, to see its implications. I'll talk more about it later, but highly problematic. Okay, botnets, different case. Um, and for botnets, we look uh, to the Netherlands, but this happens all over the world. But um, the, the Dutch case is really interesting because it shows uh, you know, the information that has emerged is just uh, very rich. So um, if you would have seen on your computer this warning screen uh, somewhere in 2000, October 25th, 2010, it meant that um, your computer was infected with the Bredola botnet and that the government had infected your computer with uh, a small piece of code to spur whenever you turned your computer on this uh, this warning screen, and this warning screen is uh, here's the the police uh, logo, public prosecutor, the Dutch uh, cert, and and a company that actually made this uh, made this malware. So this is a case in which um, a lot of computer a lot of um, uh, computers all around the world were infected with a botnet, and where the uh, the Dutch government used the botnet to mitigate the botnet. So. A botnet is uh, very basically is um, uh, a server, um, uh, a command and control server, somewhere in the world that has uh, uh, infected uh, a lot of, as you call it, uh, bot clients, and this creates this zombie network uh, in which this go uh, command and control server called the and the bot her herder that controls it. Uh, can send out commands for, you know, search for credit cards, etc., um, um, all over the world. Botnets are a really serious problem for internet security and for uh, the, and, and for crime. It's not at all to uh, under uh, understate the problem here. Um, the Dutch government had said that uh, 30 million uh, devices all over the world. Uh, had been infected. Um, they exaggerated this number at least by an order of magnitude uh, to, you know, hype up uh, the seriousness of this case. But definitely, this was a large botnet, and uh, so yeah, people were. Um, uh, uh, there was a lot of attention on this, also from other countries to do something about this, um, and uh, the the Dutch law enforcement agencies took a pretty bold approach. So. Um, 
um, some of the technical aspects here is that, um, as I already said, um, the Dutch law enforcement agency claimed that 30 million devices were, 30 million devices, so 3.0, were infected, but it was rather uh, more like one and a half million, still a lot. Um, and uh, to uh, prosecute and to mitigate the botnet, the Dutch law enforcement agencies did two hacks. One, they hacked into this command and control server. Um, they did this to find out who uh, was administrating um, the botnet and uh, to prosecute him. And the second hack was a hack into all the computers uh, around the world that were infected with the botnet in order to install a closed source, uninspected piece of code on one and a half million computers all around the world that would spur this warning screen. But it, uh, whenever this happened, uh, for years, nobody had seen the code. Nobody actually know, uh, knew what capabilities, apart from spurring this warning screen, were part of the code. And uh, users, on the other hand, would uh, see this, uh, would go to this link, um, uh, um, this link uh, mentioned here, uh, and their systems would automatically be updated. Now, um, that, of course, had uh, uh, a lot of security implications. Um, Bits of Freedom, a Dutch NGO, um, where uh, I, uh, not at the time uh, anymore, but uh, uh, where I used to, to be at, um, did a lot of Freedom of Information requests for the code. And finally, uh, well, the Freedom of Information uh, request uh, wasn't honored, uh, but the government um, uh, released the code itself. And, uh, well, if you see it, it's actually a pretty, you know, it's not that uh, uh, interesting a code. It's just basically asking for uh, the window shell to open and then um, for computers to uh, serve to this uh, URL. Um, this URL uh, would then uh, spur this warning screen. Nothing more. It's, a, it's language Delphi 6, I think, uh, not uh, particularly uh, interesting but what is interesting is for one uh, that the warning screen wasn't uh, encrypted over SSL so um, basically this opened up uh, to uh, phishing attacks where uh, you could actually impersonate uh, a website or do whatever you could listen in to all the computers uh, that were visiting this warning screen and actually assume that they had been infected by this botnet and the code was not even signed so, um, uh, basically, uh, when you went to this web page and clicked on the website uh, um, or went to the website and you uh, saw the link and that would then, you know, execute this code, the code wasn't even signed. So, there was no MD5 checksum. I mean, to cut a long story short, everybody could have inserted uh, a different uh, uh, link in there or maybe antivirus companies from a bit more rogue nature could actually um, um, uh, do all sorts of bad things there. So again, a case of law, uh, law enforcement hacking in which security was, uh, was a, a pretty serious issue. Even after the botnet was uh, uh, mitigated, uh, within weeks the botnet was already functioning again, which also turns, uh, uh, raises very important questions about botnet mitigations itself. Um, and the botnet moved from a centralized command and control server to a peer-to-peer -peer -peer infrastructure, making it even much more hard to uh, mitigate the botnet. Okay. Third case, um, ubiquitous intelligence gathering. Well, this has been over the news a lot in the last couple of uh, uh, weeks. Um, there was the end of December where Der Spiegel published the Tailored Access Operations Catalog. Uh, which uh, showed us that uh, the capabilities of especially the NSA are, and the GCHQ in Britain are, uh, are pretty far advanced. Um, and then there was uh, a week ago uh, a new slide released uh, on the, this is then the quantum catalog. And um, well, there's a lot of information here. I won't talk about everything, but uh, particularly interesting is uh, quantum DNS. You know, DNS injection is, be, is done, um, all sorts of man-in-the-side techniques, man-in-the-middle techniques. Uh, and what is very interesting is that a lot of these operations have already been operational, or a lot of these programs have already been operational for, uh, you know, for about 10 years. Here's Quantum Sky, um, 
uh, for the denial of access to a web page, already operating since 2004, etc. So um, already uh, for and and basically this is uh, dirty hacking techniques. Um, it's not uh, it's not uh, particularly special, um, but it's used and and already for a very long time. And you know, with all the revelations, I guess the basic point here is that um, well, internet security is in a pretty deplorable state, um, and also that the fact that it is in a deplorable state is being exploited uh, massively by intelligence agencies. And once again, you always need to tell this, I mean, this isn't only the United States. When these uh, vulnerabilities exist, it's quite probable that they're also used by you know, a range of other uh, countries all over the world, uh, and not to mention uh, cyber criminals. So um, uh, a lot of very, very deep problems um, and lack of uh, all sorts of um, means of oversight and, um, and legal protection. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit more. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch, uh, as this is such a new issue, and as legislators have only in recent years uh, started to, you know, in Europe, started to think about this, and only in recent months in the United States, um, um, the technical capabilities are 40 years ahead of the mindset of legislators. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and basically, just very briefly, I'll talk about you know, 11, but it could be you know, the list just goes on and on. Um, one very basic problem for cybercrime uh, mitigation is that we have no reliable data. We have no idea. Um, how much uh, the costs are of cybercrime, save the, you know, the annual report of Symantec that of course has a huge interest in pumping up uh, these damages. Um, um, they often, for example, they include uh, copyright infringements uh, for music downloaded into their reports, which is uh, numbers they directly get from the entertainment industry, that kind of stuff. It's really dodgy, it's not reliable, and we don't really have reliable data to make evidence-based policy. Very deep problem. Um, then, uh, as we already saw in the German case, there's no clear separation, there's no clear technical separation between wiretap and search. So most of the malware that is employed already has uh, all sorts of capabilities built into them, and you can argue whether uh, doing a wiretap uh, on somebody's system is actually a wiretap. Um, no, a wiretap would be looking at the wire and not at the system. But now, a lot of this government malware is targeted at the system to perform a wiretap, but built in with all these new capabilities. So this old legal conceptual separation between wiretap and search is something we really need to think about and is very problematic. And with all these systemic uh, lying by law enforcement uh, agencies um, and no laws, we have a really hard time uh, to do a proper judicial, so in the courts, and, and, and policy oversight. And we already saw this in Magistrate Judge uh, Smith's and Professor Donahue's uh, comments at the conference, but oversight is really hard, and um, where we have no reliable data on the actual scale of the problem, we have no reliable data of the actual practices either. Well, insecure malware. Um, both in the Dutch, but certainly in the reverse-engineered German Bundestrojaner case, is an information security disaster. Um, you know, in Germany we saw that uh, the malware employed could actually not only be uh, uh, subverted, but it could also be used to attack law enforcement systems. So this is like, this is like uh, you know, acid of the most serious sorts. This is something that you really don't want to touch if you don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> And then, very importantly, I think, um, allowing government hacking to occur creates really bad security incentives. So we all have a benefit with information security uh, in, our, in our networked communications, but uh, creating this possibility for, for governments to hack creates these very bad um, incentives. Uh, just as a short aside, there's, there's about three ways to uh, enter a device. Uh, one is through social engineering, so for example, phishing attacks. Uh, another one is uh, through installing a box at an ISP that enables a man-in-the-middle attack at the ISP level. 
Um, and the third is uh, to do it at your operating system, something we have already seen in the NSA disclosures that Windows Update is actually used to report um, the vulnerabilities in a, in a, in a Microsoft uh, Windows setting uh, to the NSA for them to, you know, to uh, uh, determine their attack techniques. So social engineering of an individual is one thing, but placing a box like um, a FinSpy, um, it's, a, it's a box uh, offered by this company called Gamma International from the UK, or involving operating uh, system uh, vendors in this process makes the whole, the whole ecosystem really vulnerable to attack. So this is a big problem. And the question we should ask ourselves is, will Microsoft, Apple, uh, and Google um, will they be forced by the government to comply with the request to actually uh, report back you know, security vulnerabilities or even insert backdoors in their system? On the other hand, of course, there's the ISP. If the ISP installs a box in its network, which enables like, all their millions of subscribers to be uh, hacked into, of course, if somebody hacks that particular box, then you have a really serious problem. Another, another issue is, of course, with antivirus. What is antivirus going to do when they flag uh, government malware? Will they be compelled to let it through? Uh, firewall, intrusion detection uh, companies, they all have a really, really hard problem to face in the coming years, or maybe they're already faced with this for 10 years, but we don't know about it. Sixth problem, um, the scope is completely undebated. So are we hacking into a user, into a device, into a router? into the ISP? Are we hacking botnets? Are we just hacking the entire world? Nobody uh, really has talked about this issue, and nobody really has thought about how to tailor these capabilities to specific uh, context. And this is, of course, a very difficult question, and um, uh, I'll talk a bit uh, more about it later. Seventh problem is a very obvious one. It's the one of jurisdiction. So. Um, are these capabilities only to be used within your borders or across borders, especially in the law enforcement space? Uh, Russia and China have not yet signed up to the Cybercrime Convention because of uh, territorial uh, uh, sovereignty issues. And um, uh, you can already imagine what uh, the Dutch agencies that hacked into uh, uh, a computer in Armenia to uh, prosecute um, uh, this uh, particular bot herder this Armenian guy, um, you can already imagine what uh, people in Armenia will be saying next time when uh, some attack or some uh, botnet originates in the Netherlands. And Dutch authorities haven't really thought about this until Bits of Freedom actually raised these, uh, these issues. And they were thinking, oh no, wait a minute, we're not really happy with Armenia hacking into our systems, giving them. So it's, it's, it's a geopolitical Pandora's box, right? Um, uh, and this can already be uh, witnessed in, uh, in this process of the Cybercrime Convention. The Cybercrime Convention has its issues, definitely, but it's the, one, the, one, the single most authoritative uh, legal document for uh, actually harmonizing and, and working together to uh, combat this problem of cybercrime. But for geopolitical tensions, and if we don't solve them, um, this will be uh, a convention that's only locally uh, adopted, uh, which creates all these safe havens uh, for crime. So the fact that we haven't discussed this yet is a major problem because uh, it creates a lot of distrust. Okay, and then there's of course the constitutional issue. Uh, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, there has been a lot of debate, and I've, I've already been working on this for two years, about the constitutional scope. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a well-known fact maybe here in the United States, but when we uh, presented our work in the European Parliament like two years ago about the fact that the Fourth Amendment doesn't actually protect non-US citizens. Um, people really were scared. They were thinking, hey, wait a minute, these are our friends and our allies. But um, we had to tell them that the legal reality is, I mean, there's all sorts of political reasons to be friends, but the legal reality is that uh, when I move, uh, I, I'm a Dutch and Danish national, and when I live in, in, the, uh, in Europe, I have no protection whatsoever under the U.S. Constitution, whereas a lot of European human rights treaties are, uh, are universal in scope. So this protection across borders is interesting. And, and I mean, I live here uh, not, not so far from here, but when I VPN my internet traffic to Amsterdam, do I get the same constitutional protection against the government raiding my house here in Cambridge than 
them uh, hacking into my system because they think it's in Amsterdam? Those are all super interesting and very tough questions um, that we need to think about. Now, another issue that was talked about a lot at the GL conference is parallel construction. Um, this uh, has all, uh, also been disclosed in the wake of the Snowden revelations, but, but that's where the NSA, with its capabilities, hacks into a system, uh, passes on a message to the FBI and says, you know, uh, you might want to have a look at this particular system. Uh, we can't really tell you why. And then the FBI uh, 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 constructs or rebrands this this lead and creates the evidence of its own. This is a very old issue already in law enforcement. Happens all over the world, uh, we guess, or we don't know. But in, uh, in the hacking context, it's really exacerbated and augmented. <clears throat> um, uh, there, there's, there's a number of uh, very serious legal commentators actually uh, uh, claiming that in the Dread Pirate Roberts case, this, uh, this uh, uh, guy that uh, admin purportedly administered it, uh, the Silk Road, um, uh, an unhidden service on the Tor network uh, uh, was actually caught in this way. Um, the NSA may have seen something uh, on its networks and then passed on a tip to the FBI that uh, hacked into its systems. It, this is, by the way, uh, only speculated on, on legal blogs. Um, this uh, still has to emerge um, in reality, but if I were Red Pirate Roberts' defense lawyer, I would uh, definitely uh, know where to look. Okay, um, then the fundamental question is, of course, is this hacking really necessary? I'll talk in a, in a, in a short moment about uh, Utopia, which was like this new Silk Road, a new unhidden service when the Silk Road was shut, shut down. And the Dutch police actually uh, 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 investigated and prosecuted uh, the administrators, not by hacking, but by good old undercover techniques and engaging with them. Uh, on the service itself. So do you really need hacking given all these fundamental problems? So there's a lot more and um, that's why at this conference I called government hacking, it's a bit like a hydra, this Greek mythological uh, uh, monster, you know. I mean, you cut off one head and you think you have an apparent benefit, but a, a number of problematic policy issues already emerge. So um, um, with that, um, let's take a closer look at the German case about the constitutional right for IT security. So we are right now living in this great experiment where we put our most sensitive information and data on our systems. Um, we've seen that it's really vulnerable to security attacks and the German, uh, the German Federal Constitutional Court stepped in uh, to, respond to, this, uh, to respond to this situation, this great experiment that we live in. This was in the Bundestrojaner case where the Federal uh, the Constitutional Court um, took a closer look at what actually is uh, uh, qualitatively, what is actually happening when you're talking about rights. So they ruled in this uh, case, and here's the source, that IT systems are particularly sensitive. And they separated systems from communication and data. And they said that systems, they deserve particular protection because we structure our lives on our systems. I mean, everybody here has a computer on his lap. And you can, you know, you, you not only have your work uh, documents, but you have your, you know, your holiday pictures, your email, everything is, you know, either stored in this, uh, on this box. And that actually, we even structure it. We make it ready for law enforcement to actually look into our lives. That's, that, this is literal words of the court. Um, they say this is a all-stop shop for government access. And you risk uh, making it way too easy to do surveillance. Even they considered uh, networked communication, so the cloud. They said the cloud, even though you don't store that information in your particular service, the cloud really exacerbates the privacy int intrusion. Um, uh, why is this, is this the case? Because when you hack into a system, um, very often third parties will connect to it. You will learn a lot about these third parties and you centralize a lot of your data, even more than on your own machine in the cloud. So this was a particularly tax savvy court ruling one, uh, one, one could say, and um, uh, four information security professors were witness to the court proceedings. Uh, one member of the Chaos, Communication, uh, Chaos Computer Club, one uh, uh, like anarchistic hacker, was part of, um, of, uh, of these constitutional court rulings, which was really an example of how you should do this kind of stuff. And then there's also um, the fact that 
they, with all these technical details in mind, they said, well, hacking IT systems that violates the core of privacy, the core of personality. So that's really where our most sensitive stuff is happening these days. So hacking into IT systems goes beyond a wiretap uh, uh, of your communication, and it even goes beyond the protection of your home. So here's your home. Uh, and they said, for all kinds of reasons, our IT systems are even more intrusive than, than our homes. Very interesting. So that's why they accepted this human right to the confidentiality and integrity of IT systems. And the, the CS, the computer science people here in the room will recognize the, the CIA triad here. But um, so both confidentiality and integrity is protected. This confidentiality protection has a really broad scope. It is for all general storage devices. So it's not only like your, your PC or your laptop. Um, they thought about the Internet of Things. And they thought about, um, in this court case, also about uh, RAM memory. And they thought, well, if, and about the cloud. And they said that whenever there's a general storage uh, purpose, um, it deserves this kind of protection. So it could well be that in Germany, in a year or two, your toaster has constitutional protection. It's quite interesting. Um, and this is regardless of the technical expertise, the information or operation, operational security practices of the user. So that's also really interesting. And your integrity is also protected. So manipulation of data is also covered. OK, this right is not absolute, just as privacy is not absolute. But uh, a limitation or, or a breach of this right must adhere to the strictest legal criteria. And stricter than a house search. I think that's really interesting. Um, the exceptions are, then again, uh, the foundations of the state. So it seems as if national security is, uh, uh, is explicitly allowed. Um, uh, and the prevention of uh, damages to the foundations of the state. But these preven preventative acts need to have a high probability uh, of occurrence. So you can't just you know, claim terrorism and everything's happened, but you need to particularize it. And then, very interesting, this core of the private life, which is a concept in German jurisprudence that is really the most intimate space of your, of your privacy. I won't go too much into it. But if, if you find like really intimate data, you have to delete it immediately. So that's also very interesting. Unfortunately, the court didn't really expand on this. So we don't really know, we don't really know how uh, this will flash out in detail. But at least it gave the, the basis for future court cases to, uh, to, look at this, uh, um, to, to look at this and see, well, this was really intimate data. That it should have been deleted. It cannot be part of court proceedings. All right, this is Germany. Um, but how uh, about the European Court of Human Rights? Well, I'll talk in a bit about a case called I versus Finland, where we see the first traces of this emerging. But most critically, um, the European Court of Human Rights has a couple of weeks ago fast-tracked a case in which uh, uh, both uh, uh, in which the Snowden uh, uh, revelations are central. So we will see uh, surprisingly quickly, like in a year or, or maybe a bit longer, but not much longer, we will see an actual court ruling of the European Court of Human Rights about the Snowden revelations. <clears throat> and that's really interesting. I, I included this picture because many people uh, uh, um, uh, don't realize, especially here in the United States, that the European Court of Human Rights is, is of the Council of Europe and not of the European Union. So this includes Turkey, uh, Ukraine, and, and, and of course, most uh, interestingly, uh, Russia as well. So when there's a ruling uh, about this, uh, whenever this happens, maybe next year or in a couple of years, Russia will also. Yes? About Snowden. Yeah. So an English uh, set of NGOs and Konstanz Kurz, also of the communica uh, Chaos Communication Club, a, a German uh, computer science researcher. Um, filed a court case in England against the GCHQ and against uh, the Tempora program and against the upstream program through which the GCHQ gets data from the NSA. And um, it, it's just as an aside, all the interesting, nearly all the interesting surveillance cases in the, in the Council of Europe, so in this European Court of Human Rights, are always against the UK government. It's super interesting, but every like six or seven years, there is a there's a big surveillance case against the UK government. And why is this the case? That's because the UK government, whenever you have a surveillance complaint against the government, they have created this funky uh, tribunal, 
which has secret court proceedings. It's a bit like the FISA court. And, um, and the European Court of Human Rights has said that this is not an effective means to get your, your rights. So they fast-tracked it like a couple of weeks ago because they don't see this tribunal as an effective remedy. Um, there's court cases in a several, uh, several other countries, including in the Netherlands. But in the Netherlands, you have to go through all the lower courts and you know, up, 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 up. And in about six years, you finally get the European Court of Human Rights to decide something. But it's always good to start uh, legal proceedings in England because you'll, you'll have a fast way to, uh, to the European Court of Human Rights. There we are. <laughs> this one? Oh, this. This is Ukraine. Oh. Isn't it? Oh, no, this is Ukraine. That's Kazakhstan. Ukraine? No, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, um, anyway, um, so there's a lot of action uh, here uh, with the European Court of Human Rights. And I would say, you know, in the United States, if we look at the conclusion of this uh, court case I mentioned before, uh, 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 Judge Smith uh, says that uh, there's binding Fourth Amendment pre precedent for video surveillance. This is when, you know, your webcam gets turned on. Uh, so um, there might even be, you know, some traces of, uh, of constitutional protection here in the United States. But, of course, a, a very dominant school in legal theory is this originalist uh, school, which uh, interprets the Constitution uh, like uh, the framers meant it. And the framers were, of course, uh, so visionary that they could envision government hacking. Yeah. Because you, you, you said that they didn't know who was uh, the guy. Yeah, the so machine was. they requested a whole bunch of things. It's in the court ruling. Uh, it's, it's in the request. But for example, uh, they wanted to know uh, of this particular device uh, uh, to which other device servers it made contact. So you know, basically all the internet traffic um, originating in this device, mm -hmm. because uh, purportedly uh, from this device. Um, this bank account of somebody else had been accessed. But as Judge Smith said, you know, this could just as well be a, a computer in a public library, you know. I mean, everybody could be behind this device. So um, that's what they wanted to know. They wanted to, um, let's see, if I, I read it yesterday. Um, but the IP addresses was, was the central thing. They still try to do the identification through IP addresses, which is, of course, you know, another another uh, contentious issue. Um, anyway, it's online, and um, I, I think I even have it with me. Um, I have a blackout at the moment. Anyway, to conclude, um, this right to IT security, I think if we look at a bit longer term, so wiretapping, you know, it started with Olmsted and, and Cots and all these, you know, decades of jurisprudence, but now um, 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 and in Europe, we have like 20, 30, 40 years of jurisprudence uh, before we really got a solid wiretapping uh, jurisprudence in there. I think this constitutional right to IT security uh, is definitely something uh, uh, worth thinking about. Uh, and government hacking will only increase as we move further into uh, the IT environment. So that's why uh, I just want to end with uh, raising a couple of questions for research policy and, and activists. And you know, feel free to chip in and to discuss. And, and you know, this is really a sort of open-ended kind of uh, brainstorm here. <clears throat> There's very little data I already mentioned about the root causes of cybercrime. So um, if we look at game theory, for example, and this wonder, wonder, wonderful paper, uh, uh, where do all the attacks go? Uh, if you look at game theory, there's actually a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cybercrime is a business. It's basically uh, cybercrime is not really attractive to do when you look at, you know, when you try to hack into particular systems. No, what you want to exploit is large-scale vulnerabilities. And they capture this thought in this beautiful quote, many attacks cannot be made profitable even when many profitable targets exist. So to tackle cybercrime, what we need to do is instead of you know, going uh, behind the bad guys, uh, we really need to focus on IT security, and especially in large-scale ecosystems. The move very recently of Microsoft not longer to uh, support 400 million uh, Windows XP machines all across the world is something that the le legislators should simply not tolerate. <clears throat> okay, then a uh, closer look at the human right to IT security. What about companies? I mean, companies access the, the machines all the time, right? 
Um, so how how would this right look uh, at when we when we when we look at companies? Um, there's of course the Google uh, ecosystem. Well, Google does a, by the way, a pretty good job at uh, IT security. But you know it access systems all the time. Um, I also want to mention KPN. In the, in the Netherlands, we have a net neutrality uh, legislation, and it really came about when KPN very proudly at an investors uh, meeting in London, this Dutch telecommunications company comparable with uh, AT&T, announced that it was doing deep packet inspection on all its consumers to know exactly what they were doing all of, all of the time, and that they really had a clear picture of what people were doing uh, with their mobile internet connections. Um, Related to that is the form case, where form is a deep packet inspection and, and marketing um, uh, uh, research company that British Telecom in, in, in the UK um, uh, contracted to basically spy on all their users and tell them uh, what they were up to uh, for marketing reasons. If we take this a step further, and we've had discussions about this uh, here lately, is Ethereum. Ethereum is based on this Bitcoin protocol and creates these uh, uh, distributed autonomous companies. So how is this going to work with IT security? What if, for example, we instruct these uh, distributed autonomous companies through an auction model to uh, perform uh, cyber attacks on a particular part in the world? You know, really interesting questions. We start need to start thinking about it. <clears throat> then you, your European Court of Human Rights accepted in this case, case um, I versus Finland, a positive human right to IT security. So that means um, that not only should the government refrain from hacking into system, but it should also ensure IT security through uh, specific legislation. This was in uh, 2008, the final judgment. Nobody really took notice, but I'll be working a lot on uh, this particular topic and to think about what is a positive human right to IT security, what does it look like? Yes, yes, yes. This is a European Court of Human Rights decision. Um, um, in a case of health data. So a hospital and an employer hadn't secured their systems, and the hospital said, well, we weren't on our legal obligation, and the European court said, well, uh, um, I think, yeah, Finland, uh, because IT security is such a part of the private life, um, you also not only need to refrain from hacking into system, but you also need to ensure that private enterprises are uh, taking your positive right in a similar way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the, no, this, the European court, yeah. And the, and the German court was in the law enforcement space. That and right. That was a negative right, That's exactly. What I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and then if we, you know, if we turn again to, uh, to a more broader question of intelligence agencies, not so much of law enforcement and companies, I mean, the, the research questions here are puzzling, right? I mean, Basically, we learn that intelligence agencies are exploiting every vulnerability in the book. And how are we ever going to curtail, uh, curtail those operations? Um, there's this very interesting quote, uh, you know, leapfrogging 50 years ahead um, in, this, uh, in, uh, in a paper that I really uh, I recommend you all reading. It's a case note of this German case that reads, consider the Trojan, so the government malware itself, as a digital police officer subject to the same restrictions, but also to the powers that its physical counterparts possesses. So think about, for example, the work of Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom. Think when Trojans get the capabilities to, you know, to, uh, to uh, look around on a machine and decide you know, autonomously uh, what are we going to do here. It's very, very important that eth you know, people in philosophy and ethics already start thinking about um, artificial intelligence and, uh, and and these kinds of issues. Super interesting. Policy. Okay, cybercrime policy has basically been characterized as this famous quote from uh, from um, uh, from Yes Minister: "We must do something. Hacking is something. <laughs> therefore, we must do it." Right? Uh, this is basically not tenable. So we need to demand reliable data for informed policy making. This is uh, Ross Anderson et al. Um, that tried to do this uh, uh, one and a half years ago. And just one quote, striking example, uh, the botnet behind one third of the spam sent in 2010 earned its owners about $3 million, while worldwide expenditures on spam prevention probably exceeded a billion dollars. So think about the mismatch there. We're extremely different, uh, inefficient at fighting cybercrime. What should we do instead? Well, catch the crooks, basically. 
Just a week ago, undercover, uh, just weeks ago, undercover operation, um, which is an alternative to hacking. You don't really always need to hack into everything. You can, you know, you can do all sorts of other law enforcement operations. And hacking really sounds like it's you're doing something, but maybe you're not. Um, another interesting research question is: um, There's a lot about you know law policy and technology neutrality. You should craft laws that are technologically neutral because otherwise. Um, um, when the law is adopted, it's already not, um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, in line with the technological reality. Um, well, maybe we should think about surveillance law being not technology neutral, because new technologies make the surveillance capabilities much more intrusive. So maybe we should actually demand that surveillance law is in some way technology uh, technology specific and every time you want to expand the capabilities you need a new uh, uh, you need a new authorization from the legislator research question okay well um, uh, again the NSA um, there's some real oversight needed here and not in the way that le uh, lawmakers only respond when the small satellite is turned at them and uh, thousands of uh, satellites are turned to the outside world I mean, this is, of course, uh, an issue that uh, all across the world we need to press our, our policymakers to do. Um, game theory again, cyber warfare, very different from cyber crime in the intelligence space. Uh, publication in, uh, or this was reported uh, by Nature, but uh, game theory really holds very kind of uh, discomforting lessons for cyber war. It's actually, um, you know, having the capabilities is, is very attractive from a game, game theoretical perspective. So we will see a lot of escalation here, and we have already seen it. It's a bit like cycling, you know? Um, um, if there's one guy in the entire cycling squad that takes doping and the rest does not, he has a huge advantage. And I always think about, you know, the game theoretical cyber war uh, 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 dimension a bit like cycling. Um, um, and that spurs us to the question about how are we going to curtail this? Okay, so there's both the, the dimension of, you know, countries buying these capabilities from companies. And, of course, there's, you know, um, uh, powerful nations that have the capabilities of themselves. All this, you know, these game theoretical things in the, law, uh, in the intelligence space will really char uh, challenge disarmament along with the attribution problem. So people are calling for cyber peace treaties and everything, but, you know, it's probably not so realistic. Even though it's needed, um, these insights need to feed into that process. Um, uh, and cyber war treaties are really needed along with the dual use trade restrictions, but it will be a lot harder to, to get them. Finally, on activism, <clears throat> activists have a short-term, very important task here. It's about getting, getting, uh, getting the facts out. Reverse engineer the malware, do trace route port scans, whatever, go to conferences. Um, uh, at Privacy International, Eric King and Chris Egoyen at ACLU have been really successful in this, going to conferences, obtaining marketing material, trying to, to get to know what, what the hell is going on. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, Bits of Freedom in the Netherlands uh, sent out open letters to all the antivirus companies uh, demanding software transparency and asking them directly, uh, what will you do when the government malware, uh, uh, when you detect government malware? Well, only half of them responded. So the other half, you know, we can only uh, we can only speculate. So do a lot of FOIAs on malware. Uh, try to uh, get these cases unsealed. Uh, point towards the role of industry and find whistleblowers between uh, uh, in these organizations. Um, in the Netherlands, currently under consideration is a hacking law that has way too broad uh, uh, um, uh, suggestions in them. Um, think about these 11 problems and, um, and advocate against them. Okay, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is about it. Um, a final point, um, which, has, which is a bit broader. Um, um, I'm now here in the United States for like six months. And um, I've seen in the activist community a lot of uh, focus on cybersecurity, on information security. And this recent action by Access and a couple of other NGOs on encrypt all the things um, is, of course, good. Uh, network security is an important thing, but network security is not the same as privacy. And this cartoon sort of quite elegantly captures 
um, what happens when you as an activist focus too much on, on security because uh, encrypt all the things actually doesn't mean encrypt all the data on a server. It only means the network. So companies will be happy to you know, sign up for that kind of, uh, uh, of a campaign, but at the same time uh, data mine all your data when it's on the server. So think about the different values of security and privacy uh, in your vocabulary. All right, thanks. Um, yeah. Do you know of any specific scenarios where people have had their information on a cloud data mine? Um, do you have a Gmail account? <laughs> it's the business model of the internet. Yeah. So um, basically, every cloud service um, uh, data mines all your data that you have in the cloud. Uh, it's not entirely true. There are some cloud services that provide some asymmetric uh, key encryption and encrypt your data while it's at rest. But um, yeah, you basically have to assume that every every cloud cloud uh, company, uh, um, especially when you see uh, ads, such as you know basically all the webmail providers, they're basically um, either directly serving you uh, marketing materials or uh, gaining insights from the data they have and selling it to other companies. Yeah. So it's more like active email data, not like cloud data that's been encrypted or at rest. Well, when data is encrypted, it's pretty hard to data mine. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the use of the word hacking when applied to government spying and surveillance. I know it's sort of become fashionable. I remember the first time I heard it, fairly recently, I thought, I don't like that. It's, it's, and the reason is I think it trivializes. There's a, there's a tendency to trivialize what the government are doing when they're spying on citizens. And, and I think the reason for that for me has something to do with the history of hacking at places like MIT. Hacking is this sort of harmless thing that people do. Hackers, you know, they just, they're just hacking. Yeah. So I wonder if you could respond to that. And sure. is there a better language that really captures well, what's insidious about it's this? It's very interesting. I was uh, in a debate uh, about a year ago with um, uh, some, yeah, well, some high-ranked officials in the Netherlands, let's put it that way. And they were really uh, concerned that the word hacking was part of this debate. So, you know, these guys come from a very different background than, than you, I, I assume. And um, they think that hacking, they think that hacking uh, as part of the vocabulary is really damaging them. So that's, how, how do they think that? well, hackers, come on. Hackers are dangerous people. They don't think hackers think, like, most people that are not at MIT doing hacks, like, uh, or around it, don't think that hacking is a positive fun thing. Yeah. I think that's, exactly. the, I think that's the argument. You never heard of hackathons? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, um, no. no. Well, um, no, they but vocabulary is very important, <laughs> is. and um, uh, the NSA in its slides talks of sabotage. So you know, um, Bundestrojaner, kind of, kind of a cool word, I think. But uh, it's, uh, it's really, you know, a Trojan or malware or whatever. I, I think for activists, from an activist perspective, the words you use are extremely important. I mean, that really tilts the debates. There's just, just as an example, um, in the Netherlands, uh, there has been a lot of success with the campaign against electronic voting. Um, um, yeah, sure. Um, so, no, no, no. So in the Netherlands, there's been a lot of success in the campaign against insecure electronic voting. And uh, here in, in the United States, less. And when I was talking to Ed Felton uh, at Princeton, who is my supervisor there, he said that, well, one of the critical reasons that in a public debate, electronic voting machines uh, uh, has been less successful in the States, he said, is that in the US, we call them electronic voting machines. And a machine is like a coffee machine. You push on a button and coffee comes out. Whereas in the Netherlands, it's a computer. And you know, computers, they, they, they spit purple vomit all the time. Uh, it goes wrong. And so people in the Netherlands, really, uh, the general public understood the problem of it voting computer rather than a voting machine. And that, yeah, those are his words, and I, I, I fully agree with them. Yeah. Sure. Um, I was wondering if there's been any cases where um, the government has uh, compromised a system to gather evidence and then a defendant 
has challenged the admissibility of that evidence based on one of these constitutional theories? Well, um, uh, I haven't seen them. I think that um, the Dred Pirate Roberts case is definitely uh, bound uh, to go that way. In the United States, law enforcement hacking has been mostly sealed. So, you know, that, that really also has implications for defendants in a case. Um, um, we haven't really seen it, but it's definitely a good question, and it's definitely something we will see in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, well, months, years, whatever. Yeah. Sure. Part of the wider consideration, um, much of cybersecurity I mean, kind of strikes me as petty bourgeois from like a classical left. It's all about keeping your own personal property secure. And especially in light of, you know, like when Ben Bernanke was in congressional testimony, like he doesn't have to reveal where they sent trillions of dollars. Um, and yeah. just the whole, you know, I mean, like the idea of like nationalizing the major IT companies, mm -hmm. as long as those are private and big data is seen as legitimate, it almost seems like we'll never win just because of the concentrated power of corporations being behind um, governments. <clears throat> Very good question. And I think um, uh, a lot of the response post um, already before the Snowden revelations, uh, when we did our research on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act from a European perspective and presented this in Europe, like in Brussels, the immediate response of policymakers was European cloud, you know, um, nationalize or localize the interests. Uh, to enable spying by your own intelligence agencies, but not so much by transnational uh, interests. So I think that, um, you know, a lot of the people in internet research are still, um, you know, very much thinking in this, this global perspective, but the way in which hacking and surveillance is done is, is, uh, is, is very transnational, and the way in which we will see a response from, like, industry is to further nationalize um, uh, these kinds of systems. Not so much the interconnection stuff, so I think the balkanization uh, frame um, is way overblown, um, but definitely um, we have seen this, for example, in, in routing, where uh, the U.S. Congress has said, well, we don't longer allow uh, Chinese routers in our, in our country, like Huawei, uh, you cannot do business here, or at least not in critical uh, infrastructures. Um, um, for fear of backdoors, well, of course, you know, American routers or other routers have all their, may, might have backdoors of themselves, which is, you know, still an issue open for debate. But um, the, the question of, of nationalism and sort of nationalizing uh, the cybersecurity debate and the critical infrastructure and national security is, is definitely something that uh, needs a lot more thought and, and research. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Can you uh, invite activists to uh, do uh, reverse engineering on these tools as a way of fighting the problem, I'm guessing. Uh, what legal implications could that have, given that these are uh, tools from the government to do what's supposed to be <clears throat> uh, uh, law enforcement tasks? Yeah, very good question. Um, so, uh, um, let me restate that uh, in itself, um, you know, addressing cybercrime is a, is, is, is a raison d'etre of law enforcement, right? It's a really important space to be in. But why is the reverse engineering so critical? It's, it's just to, you know, push back to give the right checks and balances. So in Germany and in, um, I, I don't know if it's in force in Germany already, but at least in the Netherlands, I know that there is a, uh, a responsible disclosure code adopted by the Dutch government. Um, so security researchers in the Netherlands, when they do responsible disclosure, when they, for example, find government malware in the wild and reverse engineer it and go to the law enforcement agencies and say, you know, you really should take uh, into consideration these, uh, these security bugs, um, uh, that um, uh, frees them from prosecution, basically. So responsible disclosure is definitely something that also needs uh, more attention. Um, and I think that, you know, if you, I think that the, the you know, the, the environment, the policy environment is, is quite, maybe not in the United States, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for, for that situation, but in Europe the, the environment is changing and really seeing the value of, of you know, ethical hacking as a, as a security tool.
So I, I think that um, responsible disclosure, we will see more of that, in, at least in Europe. Yeah. And then there was one more question. So, yeah. so on your slide, you had um, Quantum Bot, which is the NSA's um, a program of hijacking botnets. Yeah. Um, and, they, and it says they have 140,000 uh, bots co-opted. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious, uh, what, what responsibility do, do, do nation states have towards say, um, if they co-opt a, a criminal bot, what, what can they do with that? Do they have more legal power to engage in criminal activities because they did not spread the malware themselves? What, uh, like, what is the legal framework Whoa. that they're operating on? <laughs> very, good, going through criminal very good question. Um, I think that will be one of the questions to really to work on since last week, especially here in the United States. Um, so uh, in the Netherlands, uh, with the Bredelab botnet case, um, they actually went into the botnet, advertised this as a successful approach. This is a great anecdote. So they did this on te television. So they got the, the Dutch 8 o'clock news to come to, uh, to Lee's web, which is this large uh, web hosting company, and they set up a fake server and, you know, a plug, and then on the 8 o'clock news, they unplug the bot. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's really bad. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, this, this caused uh, for a lot of uh, pushback from research communities, uh, policy and, and, and especially activist communities. Um, the legal framework here is, is very opaque. And uh, as often in law, laws are created or left opaque for certain reasons. And that's why you need research and policy and activism to push back. Because, you know, if we hadn't have had this, this, uh, this slide over here, we would probably be guessing. But now we have a, a, a really sharp question to ask to our legislators. And I think that's, uh, that's very, I mean, your question is spot on. And it's really something uh, to work on. The legal framework here is, is you know, it's very, especially in the United States, when it comes to national security, uh, you can do a lot. All right, uh, time's up. Thanks.